Good morning. Every time I preach on a Sunday morning, it feels really strange to say good morning, but it is good to preach on a Sunday morning. I'm so glad to see everybody here. If you want, you can go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation 4 and 5 is where we're going to spend our time this morning. The book of Revelation is an intimidating one, right? There's a lot in there that is very foreign to our normal way of speaking and reading and thinking. But one way to think of Revelation is as a tale of two cities. On the one hand, there's Babylon. Babylon, the ancient city, represents everything that's wrong with our world. It represents selfishness and greed and oppression, cruelty, all the things that are bad in the world are represented by Babylon. And that theme really begins in Genesis 11 of the biblical story. And it traces all the way through the text, all the way into Revelation. It's a major theme in the book. So that's the one city. The other city is the new Jerusalem. And for the biblical story, Jerusalem represents everything that's good about the world. A solace from the Babylon outside. Security, holiness, justice, Everything that's right about our world in the biblical story is represented by Jerusalem. So, in Revelation, on the one hand, there's Babylon. And at this point, Jerusalem has kind of been wiped out. So, Jerusalem is now the new Jerusalem in Babylon. And it's written to, this book is written to some people who are experiencing Babylon, up close and personal. They are experiencing Babylon. But where they want to be is in the New Jerusalem. They want to pick up and take up residence in the New Jerusalem. So this this book is written to some early Jesus followers who are being persecuted by the Roman Empire for their faith. And in fact, the writer of Revelation, whose name is John, as he experiences the things that we're going to read about this morning, he is in solitary confinement, we might put it. He's exiled on an island for his faith. So these people are experiencing Babylon up close and personal. And their hope that this writer, that this vision is is hopefully bringing them back toward is the new Jerusalem. What we're reading about in Revelation 4 and 5 is John's story of a Sunday morning, a lot like this one. And he is, we might, if we're putting it in our terms, he is having his Sunday morning worship assembly all by himself because he's in exile on an island. And what happens in his Sunday morning assembly is probably not going to happen to any of us as we commune together in this room. He has, or he enters into an altered state of consciousness. The way he puts it is that he is in the spirit. You can see this in Revelation chapter 1. He has an out-of-body experience is one way that we might put it. And what we read in Revelation is a product of that experience. He's recounting his visions. And we're jumping in in Revelation 4, in the middle of this masterpiece of a story. But I think we're going to talk about enough here in these two chapters to get what's going on in the whole book of Revelation. So, let's begin in verse 1 of Revelation 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, now if you look back in chapter 1, this is the voice of Jesus. So Jesus says, come up here, and I will show you What must take place after this? So something is coming, according to this voice. According to Jesus, something is coming. Whether we want it or not, this thing is on its way. So John goes up into heaven. He enters through the door. And what he sees is unmissable. Now, we're going to have some artwork appear on the screen in in the course of talking through Revelation 4 and 5. And uh, obvious qualifier, not all of it is going to be incredibly accurate to what is happening here. Because if you read through, it's pretty hard to capture in art. But I think it's worth it to put something up here just to give us an image to work off of. So what he sees is a throne. But really, more than that, what he sees is a person, a man, on a throne. Surrounding this man is a rainbow, a magnificent rainbow with an emerald hue. And this man, he says, 
looks like jasper and carnelian. Those are two colorful gems. So you can see all the color that's on the screen right now. Just multiply that times a million. That's all the color that's going on in what John is looking at on this throne. Now surrounding um, this scene of the man on the throne, in front of him, let's just imagine if you're John and you're looking at this, you're already experiencing some type of sensory overload, right? There's a lot of stuff going on right there. So John looks down, and in front of the throne is this sparkling, glassy sea. It's just completely still. Now the thing is, above this scene, there's a storm going on, a raging storm with flashes of lightning and rumbles of thunder. There are flickering torches. So up here, all this stuff's going on. Then he looks down, and there's just perfect tranquility. Just takes a breath. And for John, looking into the sea, maybe in the reflection, he notices something that definitely catches his attention. If you're in Revelation 4, just read it with me because it's going to catch your attention as well. So as he's looking in the sea, maybe he catches the reflection of what this text calls living creatures. This is verses 6 through 8 of Revelation 4. On each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature is like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the voice or with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. Now, if you were able to follow what was going on there, you're probably pretty disturbed. <laughs> At least I am. Reading through that, those are not normal looking, as he calls them, living creatures, right? They're flying. They have eyes everywhere. So if, if we're John in this scenario, if you're like me, you probably don't want to look at them for all that long. So maybe he averts his eyes, and what he sees uh, next are 24 thrones. And these thrones have older people on them. They're called elders here, and uh, John calls them elders. And these elders have white robes, and they're wearing like Roman victory crowns, like laurel, laurel, laurel wreaths that they would win um, in the Olympics or something along those lines. So if we're following through this scene, there's a throne, there's a guy on the throne, there are these crazy living creatures, there's a sea, there are elders everywhere. A lot of this seems pretty random to us, and we're not going to unpack every aspect of this, but I want you to get what's going on in this throne room. Because suddenly, John notices that the one who's on the throne, right, the, the main guy in this scene, is holding a scroll. And this scroll is sealed with seven seals. Now, that's, that's kind of figurative language for it's sealed like a pickle jar. I don't know about y'all. I hate pickles. Pickles are the worst thing. If you, if you know me, you know that about me. Pickles, just I hate everything about pickles. But um, one of the things that's, that's really annoying about pickles is that if you try to open a pickle jar, it's impossible, right? Am I the only one who's had this experience? It's impossible to open. Maybe I just need to get stronger. Anyway, that's kind of what this is depicting. In figurative language, it's sealed really, really tight. And an angel booms out, and he echoes across this, this heavenly throne room. And he says, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? So across everything that's going on here, a voice just rings out, and it captures John's attention in spite of everything else. Who is worthy to open this scroll? And let's look at uh, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 5. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. So somehow, even with all of these crazy creatures, right? Even with the elders, somehow... In heaven, none of them are able to open this scroll. And somehow on earth, no one is able to open the scroll. Somehow under the earth, in the realm of the dead, no one is able to open this scroll. Now to us, that might not seem like that big of a deal, right? It's just a scroll. We can just kind of leave it and, and move on. But something about this is deeply disturbing to John, right? So he's... he's 
in this out-of-body experience, he's looking at this, he probably doesn't even know what's in the scroll. But something about this scene communicates to John that this is desperately important, that this scroll needs to open. So he's weeping out loud. And in verse 5, one of the elders says to him, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Now, if you haven't memorized uh, pretty much the entire Bible, you may be wondering what the line of the tribe of Judah and the root of David are. A long story short, because we could talk about this for a really long time, but just to sum up, those are two classic Old Testament descriptions of a human who is going to come along and rescue Israel from all its troubles. The nation of Israel, for a long time, had been experiencing a lot of the darkness in the world, a lot of Babylon in the world. And they held on to this hope that this guy was going to come and bring God's kingdom. And with it, he was going to drive out all of the darkness in the world. And they held on to that because of a ton of prophecies from their prophets. And one example is Psalm chapter 2 and verse 12, which says, kiss the sun. And this, this figure, this, this guy is referred to using different words. One of them is the sun. So kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. So notice the depiction of this coming human. You better bow down to him because if you don't, his wrath is quickly kindled and you'll perish in his way. So don't get in his way because he'll take you out. So this is a pretty fearsome guy, right? This son, this lion, this root, he's here. It makes so much sense that he is here in this moment because of course no one else could do this but he can. Our Savior, the, the mighty lion of the tribe of Judah, is here to rip open this scroll. So, he's about to open the scroll, and he's going to experience the feeling that men everywhere experience when we do get the pickle jar open, especially if uh, our wives or whomever has asked, it, asked us to do that. Ladies, I can only speak for one half of the human race, but even if we're annoyed that you asked us because we're doing something else, it's very, very satisfying. We feel like a knight in shining armor when we do get it open, okay? So thank you all for asking and making us feel good about ourselves. So that's what's about to happen here in Revelation chapter 5. This lion is about to break open this scroll that no one else in heaven or on earth or under the earth can do. But that's only what John has heard about, right? He's heard the prophecies. He's heard the elder announce. He's here. The Savior, the King, he's here. But then he turns. And what he sees is very different from the commercials. Because what he's expecting is a lion, a root, the sun, who mauls everyone in his way. But what he sees is, verse 6, Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So he turns, expecting to see what he was promised, right? He's expecting to see this lion, this root, this conquering king who's come to rip Excalibur out of the stone. That's what he's expecting. But what he sees is a lamb that looks like it died very recently and maybe came back to life. Like, it's kind of questionable. This lamb... It's very far from a lion who is the king of the jungle. This is, I mean, this is Mary's little lamb here. And it's not just a sheep, it's a lamb. It's not just a lamb, it's a lamb who died. It is the most helpless creature imaginable. But this lamb is the one who, in the following verses of John's account here, millions fall at his feet. These heavenly creatures, uh, that if any of them were in this room, we would be terrified and in awe and just utterly out of our senses. All of those creatures, millions, angels, fall at his feet and they shout and sing and worship about how great he is. And he's the one who, in, in the coming chapters, is going to break open those seals one by one. This lamb who doesn't even have hands, right? That's kind of the point of this image. There's, there's nothing he can do to open this scroll. 
but he's the one who's going to break all of those seals. Now, the evidence points to the fact that this scroll represents the message of the Old Testament prophets about what God is doing in our world, God's purposes for our world. And I say that for one reason, because Revelation is absolutely jam-packed with allusions to the Old Testament. That's one of the reasons why it's really tough for most of us to understand, because we don't know a lot of the Old Testament. There's, there's a lot there, right? But John knows it like the back of his hand. So he knows Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, where Daniel is commanded to, um, <laughs> great name, I always have to say that, but Daniel is commanded to seal this prophecy that he's received from God until the time of the end. Seal the scroll, it says, until the time of the end. So this scroll, that, this theme that John is picking up on from Daniel chapter 12, has something to do with the end. And remember, in verse 1 of Revelation 4, he's talking about something that will take place in the future, right? So what we're getting in on is something that happens at the end. And the whole book of Revelation is about good versus evil. It's about the, lion, or the, the lamb versus the dragon. The lamb is the mascot of the New Jerusalem, and the dragon is the mascot of Babylon. And they're duking it out for world supremacy. So it's images, the, the book's images depict the end, the end of time and space and reality as we know it. And, and the whole point is that um, this beaten lamb, we'll get to those in a second, this beaten lamb defeats this fearsome dragon. That Babylon, big bad Babylon, is conquered by New Jerusalem. There's another scene in Revelation 19 that depicts Jesus as riding in on a white horse. Now, a white horse is a classic symbol of victory. So he's riding into a battle that's about to begin. But the problem is that his white robe, like he's wearing some, some beautiful white robes, but the problem is that they're all bloodied up and the battle hasn't even started. So how does that work? Why is, why is that the image? He's riding into a battle that hasn't even begun, but his robes are blood-soaked. It's because he already won the battle. That's the image. And he won it not by spilling the blood of his enemies, but by giving his own life, by shedding his own blood. So his own blood is what has, has marred the white robes that he's wearing. And that's how he wins. Not by taking out Babylon, but by taking himself out. By giving himself up to save not only Babylon, but also the New Jerusalem. So that's why he's on the white horse, this symbol of victory, before the battle even begins. Because he's already won. So John is encountering in this out-of-body experience a reality that feels very different from much of our lived experience. Because remember, apparently, this is the end. He is experiencing the end of time and space and reality as we know it. And this is what's there. This is, this is what wins out in the end. A warrior who wins by dying. A lamb who is worthy precisely because it isn't worthy. So John is laying out a vision of reality that many of our greatest humans in the history of our race have tapped into. It's a vision that wins by losing, that conquers by being conquered, that accomplishes by apparently not accomplishing. Because God's kingdom really does come. This, this guy who they've been waiting on for thousands of years, he really does come. And he really does conquer. But he conquers by being conquered. Not by running over his enemies. Not by humiliating all of his doubters. Not by smashing anyone who stands in his way. Quite the opposite. It's really reflected in the words of Martin Luther King Jr. When he said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. Unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. A vision like that is what this text is calling us to. Now, our question, what does this look like 
for our lives right now here in the United States of America in the 21st century? Well, I think, at least in part, it looks like taking intentionally taking an inconvenient time every day to pray. I think it looks like not letting the upcoming election run your life or my life. It looks like being content to let God run the world, and I'm going to play my little part as best I can, but I'm going to realize that that's, that's all it is, right? It's my little part in this big old world that I'm not in control of. Sometimes this looks like taking the long way home. Sometimes it looks like sticking it out just a little while longer to see if God will bear fruit there or, or here, wherever it is. Sticking it out just a little while longer to see what God is doing. Sometimes it looks like giving someone else a chance to run something, whether it's at home or at church or even in the workplace, someone who you kind of doubt is maybe up to the task because they probably aren't, but you also probably weren't when you took over, right? So sometimes this looks like giving them the keys and empowering them, guiding them, encouraging them, believing in them, and knowing that they're probably going to mess up, but you're there with them. I think it really is this, this like gritty, this real, this small, that's part of what this vision calls us into. But it also is true on what we might call a medium scale of reality. Because I think this, this looks like, oh, there, there are the cool images I was looking for. Um, this is the dragon that gets beaten by the lamb which is really awesome. And there's Jesus riding into battle. But I think this also looks like these two guys. On this side is Gandhi in 1930, walking 240 miles in peaceful protest of the British salt monopoly. On this side is Martin Luther King Jr., who, of course, in our country is very famous for choosing the route of protest in peace when there's a flurry of dignified uh, or uh, justified indignation and maybe less justified violence. He chooses the path of peace, even in that flurry. And he says, hate cannot drive out hate, or only love can do that. Light cannot drive out darkness, or darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. It looks like us today, far from giving up on what's broken, in our city, our country, our world, far from giving up on all of the Babylon that's present in our reality, far from just letting it run, it looks like investing all the more while loving and shining that light more every single day. It looks like investing even more while being even better. So it's true on this medium scale. I think it's also true in the big grand story of reality. Because after all, this story is about the end, right? It's about what's going to happen at the end of time. But more than just about the end of time, and I think this is what John is inviting us to consider. This is why what he's writing is relevant to the people that he's writing it to. I think it's why it's relevant for us as well. Because more than just the end of time, this story is about something that's greater than time. Multiple times in Revelation, Jesus claims to be the Alpha and the Omega. The uh, the Alpha is the first word, the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last, or the first letter, and Omega is the last letter. So when he says that I'm the Alpha and the Omega, he's saying I am the A and the Z. He's claiming, long story short, to be the beginning and end of reality. I am the beginning, I am the end of everything. That's his claim. So, What we learn about the end of everything and the fact that he is ruling at the end means that actually that has been true from the very beginning. The entire time, the Alpha and the Omega has been in control. So, in the big, grand, true story of reality, our king has conquered. Not by fighting and clawing his way to the top, but by giving his way to the bottom, right? That's what we find. Because it's not just that, it's not that the Lamb can open the scroll in spite of being weak. It's actually specifically because he is weak that he's able to open the scroll. Look at chapter 4 and verse 9 of Revelation. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For because you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe 
and language and people and nation. In the end, weakness is power, and giving is receiving, and might doesn't always make right. That's what this story tells us about the nature of reality. Charles Dickens, his classic book, the, A Tale of Two Cities, as we said at the beginning, you could classify Revelation as A Tale of Two Cities. But in this book, there's a character, in the, and it's his name Sidney Carton, and the beginning of the story, Sidney Carton is cynical and selfish, morally lax. He's kind of just the great Gatsby, if you want a reference point. But as the story unfolds, it becomes clear that Sidney Carton is deeply in love with a lady named Lucy Manette. The problem is that Lucy is married to another man, Charles Darnay. And there's a lot of names going around here. So Sidney in love with Lucy, Lucy married to Charles. Bad place to be if you're Sidney, right? Not exactly the ideal place to be. But there's even worse news in the story. Because when we get to the, toward the end of the story, Charles, Lucy's husband, is about to be executed. Now you would think this is good news for Sidney, his, his love's husband, about to be taken out for him. But there's a huge plot twist that happens at this point. Because of his love for Lucy, also this has been out for way too long for spoiler alert, so I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna warn you. Because of his love for Lucy and his desire to see her be happy, Sidney Carton, this self-obsessed Iron Man type figure, Iron Man at the beginning of the Marvel series, because of his love for her, he gives himself up. He puts himself in the place of his love's husband to allow his love's husband to keep on going so they can be happy together. It's it's this profound act of self-giving that's redemptive, not just for Lucy and her family, but also for Sidney's own troubled soul. That's kind of what what we discover in the end, is that when we act like this, when we understand and live out the fact that this is actually the story of our reality, we find that not only is it redemptive for other people, it's redemptive for all of the darkness in our own lives. All the darkness that we want to chase away and we chase after so many things, money, power, lust, whatever it is, we chase after all of these things trying to drive away that darkness. And what we find in the end is that giving up all of that is actually what lights up the darkness of our souls. So I think that this is a story that we can find ourselves in, you can find yourself in, that I can as well. Because it is the big, grand, true story of our reality. It's a story where we expect a lion and we get a lamb. But in the end, that lion, it was gonna lose to the dragon, right? The dragon, you saw it on the screen. It was definitely gonna win. But then the lamb comes in. And somehow, some way, it won. That's the vision that Jesus invited us into. That's why his message in the world was so electric. That's why it took off. That's why it's been here for 2,000 years since he lived on our planet. And it's the message that he still invites you and me to believe and to live into. And first, he invites us to follow him into death, oddly enough. But if we come to know Jesus, we kind of just come to expect the unexpected. So he invites us into death. He invites us to go down into what Christians call baptism, to go down into the waters of baptism where, spiritually speaking, we die. And then we come back up and we're given a new life as part of a new creation as citizens of the New Jerusalem. If you've never done that or if you need to renew your commitment to that walk, won't you do it as we stand and sing together?